I'm going to introduce the moderator of this panel. He is no stranger to the biotechnology industry here in Massachusetts. He is by no means a stranger to Mass Bio as a trade association because he happens to be the chairman of the Mass Bio Board of Directors, which makes him my lead boss. So I want to say how wonderful you're doing so far on this panel, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, please uh, welcome Jeffrey Mackay, Jeff Mackay, the chairman and CEO of Organogenesis, who's going to moderate the panel. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Bob. Hi, everybody. We'll, we'll jump to it. I'll just say a few brief words. Uh, first of all, it, it's uh, a privilege to get such a, a good group together. I think it, it's uh, very apropos that we're having this within the Mass Pavilion. Uh, it, it's not very often that you can point to a specific geography and a specific point in time and say a field of medicine really originated. But I, but I believe in Boston, Cambridge, going back to the late 70s, early 80s, that really it was at some of the best academic institutions in the world and, and here in Cambridge that a lot of the early concepts, early research happened. And, and specifically, if you just, just to name a few, especially with Leanna and I here, you know, our, the founder of my company, Organogenesis, was a professor at MIT that spun out and, and formed one of the first, in fact, the first allogeneic cell therapy to be approved in the world. And uh, next door was Howard Green, which uh, spun out and formed a company which eventually was absorbed by Genzyme and was the first autologous cell therapy to be approved. So industry really spawned here and certainly academia from that point and, and has only gotten stronger. Has, has really been driven by uh, the mass innovation economy. Uh, in terms of regenerative medicine, it does go beyond the narrow definition of cell therapy. It's not just cell therapeutics. It, it's, it, in, it, we, we really want to have a broad definition inclusive of uh, molecular activators, proteins, and even the diagnostic size, using cells as diagnostics. So we want to have a broad definition of regenerative medicine, and hopefully the topics will, will encompass all of the above. The, the field itself has been around for a long time, but is really, really increasing in momentum. And, and at this point in time, there are now hundreds of trials. If you look at clinicaltrials.gov, there are hundreds of projects, active clinical projects, uh, including uh, inclusive of stem cells and regenerative medicine. And this year, I, I believe the field will have treated its one millionth patient with cell-based therapeutics. And that's excluding blood, which of course would be cheating. So uh, the, the field is, is really moving forward. And I'll just jump right to our speakers right now. So I'd like to begin with Brock Reeve, who's the executive director of the Harvard Stem Cell Institute. He's a graduate of Yale and the Harvard Business School, is executive director of the Harvard Stem Cell Institute. In partnership with the faculty directors, he has overall responsibility for the operations and strategy of the institute, whose mission is to use stem cells both as tools and as therapies to understand and treat the root causes of leading degenerative diseases. Brock? Thank you, Jeff, and thank you for joining us uh, th this afternoon. Uh, a quick, couple of quick comments about the Stem Cell Institute at Harvard. Part of the reason it was founded was uh, what Jeff was, uh, was similar to what Jeff was talking about in the tissue engineering space, regenerative medicine space, uh, uh, several years ago. And that is to capitalize on the capabilities that Harvard and the Harvard affiliated hospitals had within the ecosystem that is, it, that is Boston, with the R&D operations of many pharmaceutical companies, the biotech companies, the venture capital space, because what Harvard decided to do was capitalize on the unique resource that we have in the stem cell uh, area, ranging from very basic science to clinicians, and put together a virtual institution that spanned all the physical institutions within the Har Harvard uh, sphere with the focus of ultimately getting into the clinic, whether through commercialization or through, uh, or through clinical trials. So, let me talk a little bit about uh, what, what we've been working on. Um, we, we raise money from private philanthropy and we fund projects, scientific projects, within that network that I described, comprised of Harvard, the medical school, and the 11 affiliated research hospitals and institutions, to uh, further the, to move toward a solution for different disease categories. Now, 
the solution, as Jeff alluded to a few minutes ago, can take multiple forms. Many years ago, people thought only about cell therapies. But much of the work over the last several years has been as we understand the biology of different organs and systems in the body is understanding tissue-specific progenitor cell populations. So one of the areas of application is how do we understand how certain organs repair themselves and then what are new repair strategies? So can we, for example, find a small molecule or biologic that can help a resident progenitor cell population in an organ repair itself? as opposed to giving cell therapy. So it's opened a whole new sort of strategy in certain organ types. Another area that, and it's very fitting that we're in the greater context of bio today, is stem cells as tools, as drug discovery tools. Because with embryonic stem cells, we can grow as many of them as we want. Understanding differentiation, we can turn them into a cell type of interest with the advent half a dozen years ago of reprogramming of induced pluripotent stem cells, we can create disease models from patients of different genetic diseases. Now, now for the first time, we can recreate, to a certain extent, admittedly, human disease in a dish. And then we can test for drugs that affect the human cell of interest, whether normal or disease. And so the promise of stem cells that a few years ago people thought of as cell therapy is now not only a better understanding of biology, including cancer, when does the whole sort of differentiation and reprogramming process get, get messed up, um, but also as uh, models for drug discovery. And we think that fundamentally they hold the promise of changing the economics of the drug discovery. And that is what's been attract, that's in the last few years, has attracted the biotech and the pharmaceutical industry into this aspect of the regenerative medicine space and say, how do we find better drugs faster that are relevant, more relevant, more efficacious, and, and are safer? Now, one of the things from a business model perspective, and this may be one of the challenges that the, uh, the industry faces, is funding. I told you we're dependent upon private philanthropy. We're, um, and one of the things I see going on in the field is an, uh, people attempting different business models as NIH funding uh, stays flat, which means it's falling in real terms, as pharmaceutical companies are finding pressure in their pipelines and are moving to slightly later stage investments, at least compared to the academics, as venture capital companies are having concerns about the rate of return in life sciences compared to IT or other industries. And then one of the interesting issues is how disease foundations and private philanthropy have stepped in to fill a gap. And now we're seeing many different funding models where founda foundations, companies, and academia are partnering together in this space in order to advance uh, the field and move things out of the lab and into the market. And so I think we're, we're one of the areas of experimentation is not only science, but business models. Thank you, Brock. Next, I'll pass it to Rene Mayer. Dr. Mayer is an assistant professor in molecular medicine in the University of Massachusetts Medical School and works with the Diabetes Center of Excellence at the UMass Memorial Medical Center. His research interest is the generation of an auto, autoimmune prone immune system for patient specific induced pluripotent stem cells with the long-term goal to recapitulate the disease in a patient-specific manner and to identify novel treatment strategies. Thank you. Uh, I'm a junior investigator and I'm uh, very close to the uh, bench uh, at this point still. So I'd like to uh, elaborate a little bit more on what Brock uh, mentioned, one area that we are particularly excited about where we think uh, we can have a, a real impact on, on personalized medicine. At UMass uh, Medical School, we, uh, we focus not only on, on research and education, but also on the patient. And at the Diabetes Center, we would like to uh, use therapeutics that are currently available, but also find new, uh, um, new intervention methods. And uh, we would like to use uh, a new technology that has developed in the past uh, couple of years where we can reprogram somatic cell to a pluripotent stem cell stage. So for many complex diseases, we actually do not know what the genetic um, predisposition is. So genome-wide association studies tell us uh, a handful of the, um, genes that are uh, implicated, 
but we don't understand whether every um, patient is uh, the same patient or has the same um, predisposition as, as another patient. So what we would like to do is we would like to build a disease model from pluripotent stem cells. Through reprogramming technology, we can capture a um, genetic makeup in a stem cell, and we can then uh, go on and differentiate these stem cells into the uh, cell types that are implicated in the disease. For type 1 diabetes, uh, when a patient comes to the clinic, about 90% of the beta cells that are uh, secreting insulin are destroyed. So this leads to a, a loss of glucose homeostasis, and um, the patient becomes hyperglycemic. Unfortunately, at this point, the disease has progressed for, for a long time, and we can't actually find out what the uh, key event was that uh, led to the uh, disease. So we speculate that if we would treat with a cell source uh, these patients, give the patient new beta cells, these uh, patients would actually start an autoimmune response uh, against those, those uh, new cells as well. So we think it's key to understand the first steps of the disease. And this is a, a multi-PI, multi-institutional uh, collaboration between people at the HSCI, at uh, UMass Medical School, and at uh, JAX Labs. What we do is uh, we take patient material, uh, we program it in, into pluripotent stem cells, and differentiate it to, uh, to the immune system that is implicated in the disease, as well as the uh, beta cells that are lacking in, in type 1 diabetes. So these cells, then, we can let interact in, in a uh, tissue culture dish for in vitro uh, disease models to find new uh, intervention methods, or we try to humanize my, uh, mice, so-called uh, uh, mouse vessels, if you, if you wish, in, in animal um, experiments where, uh, where we can have these cells interact and um, look at a patient-specific immune response in, in these uh, humanized mice. Um, in the future, we think we can then move on and in vitro also uh, build little um, organ systems, so not only one cell type, but multiple cell types that are implicated in the disease, to then uh, screen for treatments or for drugs that uh, benefit the disease uh, phenotype. So this is now different from the traditional biochemical uh, um, venture to find uh, compounds that uh, have an impact on a disease or on, a, on an enzyme that is uh, malfunctioning. So we can now screen phenotypes on a cell-based uh, assay. Thank you, Rene. Next, uh, Joseph Bonventre, the Samuel A. Levine Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, Chief of the Renal Division of the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and Chief of the BWH HST Center for Biomedical Engineering. He is past president of the American Society of Nephrology and, he is, and is a member of the ASN Council. His research focuses primarily on the study of kidney injury and repair with special emphasis on the role of biomarkers, inflammation, and stem cells. And he's an advisor to a number of pharmaceutical and biotech companies on patient kidney safety and kidney therapeutics. Thank you. Well, it's great to talk to you um, this afternoon. I'm going to focus because we just have a few minutes on uh, surprise the kidney and uh, the interactions with regenerative medicine. Uh, in many ways, uh, regenerative medicine could be traced back even to um, uh, arguably to 1954 when the first kidney transplant, the first solid organ transplant, was performed at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, since that time, uh, there's a number of uh, evolutions and, and uh, clearly the work that's been done in the skin, uh, the work that was done um, in, by the Langer group and the Vacanti group uh, at Harvard and MIT and all the descendants of that group um, laid the foundation for the field of tissue engineering and a number of, uh, of companies, some of which uh, you may be involved with. Um, the kidney, let me just say a few words about the kidney. The kidney together uh, filter 180 liters of blood a day that's entering the, um, uh, the filtration system and actually coming out of the filtration system. The kidney reabsorbs 178 of those liters back and you just get one to two liters of urine a day. So why is the kidney interesting? Well, from a number of perspectives, 9% of the world's population has chronic kidney disease. And in fact, um, 
most patients who have chronic kidney disease never get to dialysis. We sort of assume that chronic kidney disease is dialysis or transplantation, but it's not. 90% uh, of the people who have chronic kidney disease die before they get to dialysis. And chronic kidney disease is the leading risk factor of all of them for cardiovascular disease. So if you think about the market, you're dealing with an enormous market and we talk about a lot of risk factors for cardiovascular disease and what we're trying to do about them, um, but chronic kidney disease is the leading one and most cardiologists, in fact, I think all cardiologists would agree with that right now. So the problem with the kidney and as it relates to regenerative medicine is that once you get chronic or once you get an element of fibrosis and kidney disease, things just progress. We haven't figured out a way. We have no therapeutics really except for angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors which help a little bit. We have no therapeutics for this enormous market with uh, chronic kidney disease. So what are we trying to do? We're, number one, we're trying to learn why the kidneys can't regenerate. Human mammal, mammalian kidneys can't regenerate as compared to fish, for example. Fish produce new nephrons throughout their lifespan. Humans, uh, premature birth results in a cessation of nephrogenesis for reasons that we don't understand. So there are some fundamental factors that are in play that shut off this mechanism in mammals, in, in humans, um, and they're persistent in fish. And certainly we all know about salamanders that can regenerate organs, so there are a number of of species that can actually regenerate organs, and we'd like to obviously do that for the kidney, at least in part. Um, short of that, what we'd like to be able to do is uh, reprogram some of these um, cells that are producing the, the um, fibrotic response. So if we could just stop the progression of chronic kidney disease, we will have done a great deal for patients. We don't have to reverse it even, we just have to stop it. Um, some approaches that we're doing relate to the interventions with mesenchymal cells, mesenchymal stromal cells, and you know companies like Alicure locally, uh, another company like Sention, a small company that I've been involved with a little bit, um, these are companies that are trying to use mesenchymal stromal cells either by injecting them into the body. Um, they seem to have an anti-inflammatory effect or in the case of, of this other company, Sention, uh, putting them in an extracorporeal circuit and using the factors that are released by these cells um, to affect inflammation in the body. We're also um, involved in, in IPS, which's been mentioned already, the um, induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, for example, we've made some from patients with polycystic kidney disease, the most common genetic disease, polycystic kidney disease, accounting for 10% of all patients are on dialysis. And, um, and we have in a dish a cell line that has a defect that's been described in, um, in, in polycystic kidney disease. So we think that that might be a good in vitro, uh, ex vivo cell culture system to be able to look at therapeutics. Uh, we're trying to differentiate cells down to kidney cells because one of the major components of this whole field is to try to get a differentiated kidney cell that actually acts and works like a kidney cell in culture. That's been enormously difficult to do. People have worked on it for 50 years and they haven't succeeded. If you have that, you can then have efficacy uh, tests, you can have toxicity tests, and as you all know, one of the big ticket items for all of drug development is nephrotoxicity. Secondary to liver toxicity, um, the kidney is the major source of failure of drugs because of uh, toxicity. So if we could have a predictor in vitro with a kidney on a chip, as it were, uh, we would do very well. Another aspect in the, in the urinary system is the bladder. And uh, we personally are not involved in the bladder, but that takes advantage of scaffolding, uh, tissue engineering, and Tony Atala actually started that when he was at Children's Hospital here. 
and that's evolved to you know small company uh, Tenjian that's in North Carolina uh, that's still working on a, a ureteral uh, conduit essentially based on a scaffold and seeding bladder cells. Uh, the problems, I, I'll, I'll stop there, but the problems are, have already some of them been mentioned on a scientific level. Um, some of the problems are the concern about stem cells and the fact that there may be some uncontrolled effects on carcinogenesis and vascularization. Uh, with any of these interventions in vivo, how do we get the vasculature and the microenvironment to team up with the cells and produce a functional unit? So with that, I'll stop. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Joseph. Next, Liana Caron, who is the Vice President and General Manager, Cell Therapy and Regenerative Medicine at Sanofi Biosurgery. Liana is a healthcare executive with 17 years of global marketing and business management experience. She's currently Vice President and General Manager overseeing global commercial operations and medical affairs for the cell therapy and regenerative medicine business. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so I'm going to cover um, three things in this brief uh, introduction today. First, I'll speak about our area of focus in cell therapies and regenerative medicine at Sanofi. Um, just as an aside, many of you probably know, uh, Genzyme was acquired last year by Sanofi. Uh, the small division that we have in cell therapy and regenerative medicine is about 230 experts, I would say, because this space really does demand expertise. And um, furthermore, the group of cell therapy regenerative medicine within Sanofi uh, reports into the Sanofi structure, uh, although many people still associate themselves with Genzyme because, of course, that's where cell therapies all originated from. So I'll speak a bit about our area of focus, as I mentioned. Uh, the second thing I'll speak about is our accomplishments to date. And lastly, just uh, give you a few perspectives on what I believe are the future outlooks of this space in general. So um, cell therapy and regenerative medicine uh, within Sanofi comprises three commercial products. We're one of the few companies who have products on the market today. Two of these products are in the space of regenerating cartilage of the knee, uh, allowing individuals to get back to active uh, daily living activities or to sport. Uh, it really is quite remarkable what a patient who receives either Cardicel or Macy if they live outside of the US uh, can do after they receive this type of treatment. And the third commercial product that we have on the market today is a product called Epicel. This is a product that regenerates skin and is used for patients who have greater than 30% of their total body surface area affected by a third degree burn. Uh, again, this is a life-saving treatment for these individuals. And all that's required to make this um, a realization for these patients is two postage size stamps of healthy skin for our scientists who are also based here in Massachusetts to be able to regenerate skins of sheep, as, um, sheets of skin rather, that will allow them to protect the body as they heal and therefore prevent infection going forward. So truly remarkable products that are life altering to all the individuals who need them. Uh, we have these products uh, commercialized in over 16 countries throughout the world, uh, but it all originates here in Massachusetts with our, our core scientist base being here at, on Sydney Street in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, and much of the business and activity that happens here in Massachusetts as well. Um, like I said earlier, 230 uh, people work in this space and that comprises all of our, uh, our uh, key activities, whether that be from the commercial side of things through to our scientists and our manufacturing uh, individuals. Um, the other thing I'll just mention is we also have many partnerships and we've entertained and been part of many partnerships throughout the years of our uh, 16 plus years of existence. Um, and that has spanned on only autologous cell types, but gene therapies, uh, as well as tissue engineering, um, et cetera. So Genzyme has brought a really vast contribution to the space of regenerative medicine in general from the early days. Um, our accomplishments to date, given the three products that we have commercially available today, is we really think, I think, demonstrated that with an autologous-based product, you can have a successful business model. Uh, the U.S. is a profitable entity uh, as we go forward, and it, it surely does demonstrate if the, you bring the right product to the right patient population and bring a high enough science and where there's a medical need that you can actually sustain and have a, a decent business model going forward. 
Um, the other accomplishment, I think, to date to speak about is the fact that we've treated over 25,000 patients worldwide with these very innovative treatments over the years. And in fact, Genzyme has played a key role in the development of regulation uh, over the years. Not only regulation in the United States as it relates to cell therapies and regenerative medicine, but regulation in other parts of the world, particularly Europe, who's enforcing this year uh, advanced therapies medicinal product regulation uh, that will set a new standard for which all products will have to compete and, and deliver with respect to ultimately delivering enhanced patient safety when one wants to choose a regenerative therapy. Um, last but not least, I'll just speak a bit about uh, my outlook and what I think about the future of this space. Uh, I really am a proponent about making sure that the proper regulations are in place. Uh, there's much in the news and all of a sudden cell therapies, regenerative medicine has become a sexy topic in the media, but we've been doing this for a long time. And I think what we've realized over this time is that you need to have the right checks and balances in place to make sure that not only are we advancing from an innovation perspective, but ultimately that it's protecting the patient going forward. So outlook that I uh, anticipate is with regulation coming into place throughout the world and with different uh, regulatory bodies looking at this uh, more um, simultaneously and hopefully cohesively uh, that we'll be able to advance this space at a nice pace. It's not going to be a super fast pace with regulation, of course, in place, but that it will be more prudent and we'll get the right therapies to patients who need them in the future. So thank you. Thanks, Leanna. Finally, Donald Brown, Chief Executive Officer of Arteriocyte. Uh, Mr. Brown has spent 18, uh, has over 18 years of accomplishments in the healthcare industry, including running a $2.5 billion prescription allergy franchise at Sharing Plow. He brings to the company extensive management experience, including business development and operations management, as well as sales and marketing, disease management, and managed care contracting. I feel like I'm the outsider here. Um, the group at the table has either started companies in Massachusetts or developed a tremendous amount of research development exercise in the state. We started in 2004 as a one employee, no salaried company that had no capital in it, but, but we had one single provisional patent application that we had just licensed from a university in Ohio. The, the thesis behind the company at that time and today still is cell therapies to trigger therapeutic angiogenesis. The view that is well known in, in medical oncology is that, and, and this has been for over 30 years, when a solid tumor becomes lethal, it's often because that tumor has developed its own vascular network, it starts to bud its own vessels and that feeds the tumor faster. The, the basis of our company was, if you didn't have cancer, yet you could coax the body into building new, ves new vessels, what could you treat? The instant thought was chronic coronary ischemia, right behind it, peripheral vascular disease, uh, thermal injuries of burn wounds for patients. And, and that started us down the path. It, from 2004 to 2005 of working with a partnership, the National Institute of Health and the FDA to initiate our first in man work that was marrow taken from your hip, purified to a hematopoietic stem cell population and delivered back through a coronary catheter for patients with chronic ischemia. At the time we conducted that clinical trial, 10 patient dose escalation trial that took six months to accrue and treat with one year follow up shortly thereafter, we had a total of three people in the company. The first three years of our existence, however, we suffered through what Brock mentioned. We had to fund ourselves. Now my view has always been cash or capital is not our enemy, time is our enemy, but you know, capital would be nice as well. By the end of the third year, we had raised a total of $3 million, all non-dilutive, all through partnerships with the NIH, private foundations or state organizations. A lot like I'd be knocking on your door, Brooke, asking for help. At the time, we had also brought into the company four technologies from Johns Hopkins and the University of Minnesota and uh, Stanford to enable our cell therapy footprint. We found very quickly, however, that one of our target strategic partners, a big medical device company, 
actually had a technology that could help us do what we were already doing much faster than what we could do using a blood lab in a, in a cancer center. And so in 2007, we actually helped Medtronic divest this business that was instead of antibiotic bead selection to purify a stem cell population, it was frankly centrifugal force in a 15 minute process. So we went from a purification process that was eight hours in a hematology lab at a hospital where we'd have to go through and do HIV, hep C, hep B, cytomegalovirus testing because the unit had left the operating room in order for us to deliver it back to the patient. We immediately converted to a, a company that had a bedside tissue selection and processing technology that could process and hand back to the surgeon in 15 minutes a concentrate of cells that they desired. So today, eight years later, we're 70 employees. We have operations in three states, Ohio, Minnesota, and here in Hopkinton, Massachusetts. We export our technology to 18 countries U.S. Uh, outside the United States, and we enable 6,000 procedures a month. These procedures are in cardiac, orthopedic spine, foot and ankle fracture repair, tendon oses. If anyone pays attention to uh, Tiger Woods who had injections of PRP for strained tendons, uh, Bartolo Colon, any Yankee fans here? Uh, uh, Blake Griffin, uh, that tendon injection of a concentrate th that's harvested from blood is effectively bedside enablement of a therapeutic jumpstart for healing. We also work in chronic wounds and we work in cartilage regeneration. So Leanna's group is, is a, a team that I admire immensely. They take self, self, meaning the donor and the recipient are the same patient, and they work to culture up a, a far greater number of cells than what the patient has. And the organs, uh, and I view skin as an organ and I view cartilage as an organ. In our setting, we're just bringing the starter fluid. We can get a concentration six to eight fold above baseline concentrations from that patient in 15 minutes just by removing the noise. And in our first trial with, that the FDA allowed us to go forward with, the, one of their predominant questions to our process was, what are your contaminating cells? And when we realized that they were all erythrocytes, we recognized that the blood really has great effect as an oxygen carrying cell, but limited to no effect and sometimes contradictory effects when you look at therapeutic angiogenesis, vasculogenesis, or tissue repair. So we moved into the state of Massachusetts in 2008. At the time, we had nine people in the company. That was globally. And I was the only Massachusetts resident. So four years later, we now have 30 of our 70 employees here in Massachusetts. Uh, we have our own clean room manufacturing and, and customer service as well as our quality clinical regulatory affairs and our, our finance team out here. But we've always taken the view that technology is never bound by the perimeter of a state. So instead of just looking at within Massachusetts to find novel technologies, we have no, no issue of importing those technologies into the state. We started with one provisional patent application that had not had a USPTO action, office action at the time. Today we have 62 issued patents uh, and another 13 provisional or PCT throughout the world. And, and our view as we go forward uh, with the partnerships we have with the US military on three clinical programs for compartment syndrome, uh, uh, burn remediation and infection control, as well as our self-directed critical limb ischemia work and cartilage regeneration in uh, adjunct to microfracture with patients in, with osteochondral defects. We believe that there are appropriate roles for multiple executions in this space, whether it's self-self, cultured cells to get above the the baseline of a therapeutic ind index to trigger that, that regeneration or massive tissue coverage from a, from a cultured keratinocyte or maybe the body just needs a nudge.
And so from our perspective, we are now today in three FDA phase one, phase two clinical trials. We have two more planned this year. And our, our ultimate enablement, our goal, is to help drive patients' access to help heal themselves faster. Thank you. Thank you, Don. So uh, we will open up to questions. But as you can see, what we've really tried to deliver today is a broad representation of the Massachusetts ecosystem, looking at big life science companies, medium, and some at the earlier stage, and from an academic point of view, from basic to translational research, all of which is focused here in, in regenerative medicine. So uh, if there's any questions from the audience, we'd, we'd entertain them now, otherwise I have a few. A anybody with a question? Okay, so what, what I'd like to just go through from, uh, I guess starting with Brock uh, towards me is, to, to just get an idea of what you think the, I guess the, the near-term pending advances or achievements could be in the field. Um, it would be nice to say that there are uh, too, too many to count. Um, I, I, I would go back to, I, I think the, the near-term in terms of revenue production is the stem cells either as uh, as drug discovery tools um, for the pharmaceutical industry, or as we understand more about these tissue-specific progenitor populations. And what do I mean by that? For example, um, well, Joe and Renee talked about, you know, does the kidney or do, do, do the pancreas have progenitor cells um, or tissue-specific stem cells? And it looks like probably not. We know blood does. We know skin does. We know we've learned over the last few years that heart, the heart has a very small, very rare progenitor cell population. So one of the things that we're doing now is looking for drugs that can stimulate the endogenous repair capability. So I think that is, and the reason I dwell on sort of the drug aspect, whether biologics or small molecules, is because except for some of the therapeutic strategies that Leanna and Don mentioned, uh, the regulatory process for cell therapy is bound to be slower because the body doesn't, th than it is for a drug, because um, whatever you think of the FDA, inherently they're going to have a more skeptical view of putting cells into people if the cells, A, can turn into something different than what they started out from, and B, can go other places in the body, and C, aren't excreted and metabolized the way a drug is. So the whole regulatory process around cell therapy by definition is going to be much more com complex and will be dependent on, I think, on some new technologies such as imaging. So how do we have new advances in imaging that help us understand where these cells are going and what are they doing? Um, which, which leads me back to part of the rationale is let's focus on drugs that either we find as a result of using stem cells or drugs that we find that can stimulate internal po cell populations. So, <clears throat> from the perspective of in, in vitro disease modeling, I think what would have a, a great impact on the field is if we actually understand how to make these stem cells differentiate into the cell types that are actually affected by the disease. So I think the pop bottleneck right now for, for our uh, area is that we don't understand all the cues or signals that we have to provide for the stem cells or progenitor cells to differentiate further. And uh, I think as we understand more about stem cells, progenitor cells, and the signals, how to guide them to the proper cell types, uh, we will make advances and actually make the cell types that matter for a disease. And this will be not only important for the uh, disease modeling in the dish, but also for cell replacement therapy to make uh, safe cellular products uh, from, from stem cells. Yeah. I would say that a lot of um, what's necessary at this point is to, to, um, to get cell preparations that are reproducible, that are understandable in terms of their differentiation state has been already mentioned, so that one could reliably, if one has an effect, uh, predict that that effect will be maintained uh, because you have biomarkers that could uh, are reliable in terms of using as a metric 
for the, uh, the sell properties. I, I also think, um, I actually think we're not too far away, as has been mentioned, from using these differentiated cell types to really be um, um, important predictors of toxicity and efficacy. And so I think, I think that's something that will come uh, pretty soon. From my perspective, um, from my perspective, I'll speak more from the standpoint of companies who have products in development that are autologous in nature, meaning originating from the patient. Um, a scientific advance that will, I think, further this space is the fact that if we were able to select the most potent or the most healthy cells coming from that patient, that originating patient, in order to predict an optimum outcome, uh, for the patient who's ultimately going to receive those cells who've been expanded. That would be a significant advance that would create enhanced value creation and also improve patient outcomes. Now, we've made a lot of advances in that area in terms of being able to pick the right kind of cells because you get a mix when you get that biopsy from a patient. And, it's, and obviously, unless the injury was caused by, um, unless the, default, the defect was caused by an injury, um, you may have a mixed population of cells when you're getting that biopsy. So your ability to pick and expand the best cells from that um, culture that you get is most important for the patient as well. Uh, as I said, we've made a lot of advances in this space. Our scientists have been able to um, get patent protection around identity assays and potency assays, which do two things in the space of cartilage. Um, an identity assay ensures that the cells that you're expanding are chondrocytes for cartilage repair, and that they do what chondrocytes are supposed to do in, in, with respect to the potency assay, and that is regenerate normal cartilage. So the further we can advance that uh, space from a scientific perspective, I think we'll ultimately come back to paying dividends, not only for the patient in terms of what they'll get, uh, by way of return in terms of feeling better, quicker, et cetera, uh, but also in terms of creating value creation in general for this space. And in my view, the next leap forward will be in the clinic with regular use around 4.30 this afternoon, meaning it's the bridge between autologous and allogeneic co-delivery. It's already happening in orthopedics today. Now, we enable something at bedside to concentrate the patient's own cells, but for the last two years at hospital specialized surgery, at Cleveland Clinic, at Mayo, at Baylor, orthopedic surgeons doing OATS implants for massive osteochondral defects have taken cadaveric bone plugs, bone and cartilage plugs, to put back in to that defect. And for, for those last two years, they've consistently soaked those plugs in the concentrate that has been processed, taken from the patient immediately prior. None of those surgeons feel that that is enough. There's a faster way to get a, a cartilaginous integration in that defect. But when you look in the trauma space of acute injuries with massive tissue defects, our, our surgeon customers today are taking cadaveric demineralized bone matrix or cadaveric bone segments and driving these cells into them. What I see from the bench to bedside efforts that, that keep coming through my door are initiatives that are focused on rapidly endothelializing coronary stents, uh, path, path, pathways from um, uh, bladder slings to take a synthetic or a, um, a, a collagen-based sling and embed it with the patient's own cells as a anti-rejection mechanism and, and hope to get those cells to integrate into the tissue, that you've got enough local messaging to drive them into the functional tissue that will give a durable effect. We've even seen at American Heart Association cells being perfused back into a acellularized heart and getting that heart to beat. So I tend to think that some of the nearest term clinical executions that you may actually be uh, evaluated on and offered by one of your surgeons in the next couple of years may actually be this autologous allogeneic co-delivered technology. Thank you.
So I, I agree. I, I would add one, and maybe it's just because I see Zarina and Pat in the audience with uh, their regulatory hats on. But I, I do think that one big advance is the ongoing evolution of, of understanding of how to regulate this industry. And uh, we recognize right now that I think EMA has, has approved one cell therapy and uh, F FDA a handful. It, it was a big advance when Dendrion Provenge was approved by CBER. And, I would, and we believe uh, at Organogenesis that the first allogeneic cell therapy, Gintuit, our, our product was approved by CBER in, in March. And so we, we believe that that's very relevant because a lot of the challenges, questions have been asked in the first generation of regulatory approvals. And as Leanna said, I think a lot of the companies have invested a huge amount of energy in working with EMA and with FDA. And uh, what, while it's not perfect, I think that the regulators have moved light years in the last few years. There's a lot of guidance documents, a lot of work going on, uh, white papers on potency assays and so forth. So it's not a well-traveled path, but it's a path that has been traveled. And I think it's making it a lot easier for the, for the, uh, the coming companies. We, we have time for one more quick question. If, if it's from the audience, I'll take it. Otherwise, I'll pose it. A anybody? Yes. Hi, my name is Ross Tubo. I have a question regarding: uh, Have you look? Have you been looking at the underlying biology to understand what uh, potential defects may be, either in uh, myocardial infarction or renal disease, and then studying the cells, and then looking at being able to uh, apply agents other than cells, essentially identifying targets for interaction and then try to understand the biology and then modify uh, using other agents. And from the kidney point of view. How's the um, sound? I, I don't think your sound is, is the, that okay? Okay, from, okay. is it come up? Okay. From the uh, kidney perspective, um, there's uh, an evolving story here whereby acute injury um, is now more and more recognized factor in progression of chronic kidney disease. And, and at the cellular level, it's some interesting features of that is that, um, and the way our work has led is that as the cells that have this intrinsic capability to repair, the epithelial cells of the kidney, if you injure them, it's like injuring the skin. You can get repair. Um, the problem is that the repair in many cases becomes maladaptive. And the maladaptive nature of it, you see it on the skin and fibrosis, let's say, well, that's not necessarily maladaptive there. But, but in the, um, and except if it's a keloid, but if it's, you know, in the kidney, it is maladaptive. So, and part of it relates to the cell cycle. And so we're actually targeting um, the cell cycle. There seems to be a holdup in getting cells through the cell cycle. By being held up, they produce profibrogenic factors. And in fact, there's some data from other groups that suggest that maybe the therapeutic is to kill those cells and allow the ones that are healthy to go through a more uh, protective and, and uh, adaptive uh, replacement of the damaged cells. So those are, yeah, those are things that we're doing. And when, you, when you look at the heart specifically, there is a body of evidence that has increased dramatically in the last 10 years. In 2001, 2002, a number of German investigators were doing direct myocardial injections of cells. It, Medtronic and Genzyme put together a joint venture to use myoblasts, not cardiomyocytes, but myoblasts out of a biopsy from a thigh muscle. You ran into a challenge of fast twitch versus slow twitch cells. And, and what the medical surgical community had found by mid-2006, early 2007, was direct muscle injection of cells would result in retention of the cells you've delivered of about 24% at two minutes. And at 24 hours, it was down to about 8% of those cells. So if you talk about cells as the agent that you deliver to try to transform that function, clearly there was a, a woeful efficiency curve against that. When you look at uh, when you look at repairing the tissue itself, the, the other side of the body of evidence in the heart is in an acute insult, like an infarct, if it's a late presenting infarct for that patient, you tend to get necrosis through that starved tissue. 
If, on the other hand, it was an earlier presenting infarct, those, that, that tissue is stunned and may hibernate, and the hibernating zone of the insult could actually be resuscitated. The, the, the other piece of that acute insult of an infarct is that there's such a, I wouldn't call it a fulminant, but there's a rapid inflammatory response immediately after the, the infarct occurs that from 2006 to 2010, a lot of the research scientists recognize delivering any agent in that setting of rapid inflammation may also be fighting against a strong headwind. So that so the, the injection strategies all migrated back towards five to seven days after the, the, the fulminant uh, in, infarct had occurred to allow the inflammation to dissipate. So when you look at the span of 10 years, the learning that's come in just in one organ, in the heart, and how the biomechanics of that heart uh, affect its receptivity to any therapeutic agent, whether it's cells, whether it's genes, whether it's proteins, or, 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 or an agent that needs some path of clearance. I think we're far further today than we were in, in 2002 by a long shot. Anybody else? Did anybody care to comment? A any other questions before we wrap up? Okay, well, thank you very much. Have a good day.